Well, welcome everyone to the ArtsLink Assembly, uh, virtual assembly this year. We moved from being one day together in New York to five weeks online. Uh, this is week four of our five week assembly. Uh, and we're this week looking at the whole principle and ideas behind the no borders movement and post nationalism. As you probably know by now, the ArtsLink Assembly is an annual convening that CEC ArtsLink organizes, which brings together artists and colleagues to really look at the role artists and uh, cultural practitioners play in building both a civil society and achieving the level of social justice that all of us are keen to see in the world. This week, I'm very, very happy that Thomas Nail, philosopher at the University of Denver, uh, has curated the week. Uh, there's a whole range of resources that you can see uh, on our website, readings, uh, films, movies, uh, documentaries, a whole range of things that you can use to dive into these, uh, these ideas, which in many cases still seem uh, abstract, but I hope by the end of today, you'll see that they're not only tangible, but are being already implemented by many people around the world. Thomas will, uh, will, will introduce everyone, but I just wanted to say that uh, in, we have a panel today. So the format will be three presentations and then the Q&A at the end. Um, I should I should perhaps say, if you're still waiting for uh, the results from Arizona, we, we're reliably informed that that will be at the end of this. But if there's any major developments, I'll certainly bring it to you. So don't feel you're missing out. Um, so Thomas is joined by uh, Alex Sager. Alex is professor at the University of Portland. And we're very happy he could, he's able to join us. He has a new book just published, uh, which is called Against Borders. And it's why, why the world needs free movement of people. So it's a very clear title and he'll be uh, uh, explaining some of the thinking in the book. And we are very happy that Nandita Sharma, uh, Professor of Sociology at the University of Hawaii can return. She had a great conversation with Thomas yesterday about her book, Home Rule, uh, but Nandita will be part of the panel too. So use the Q&A box at the bottom of your, um, your console uh, to submit any questions and we'll take them towards the end. But meanwhile, here's Thomas, welcome. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Simon. And, and thanks, to, thanks to everybody for attending and, and to Alex and Andita. So the, the, the structure of our, 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 our presentation today, we'll, we'll go in order, we'll start with Nandita who uh, will will provide some of the, the 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 grounds for critique and the arguments for um, no borders, the critiques of nation states, how we uh, how we are sort of framing the the problem, and then Alex will go second and then discuss the no borders position um, and our, the the arguments and debate around it, um, and then I'll try to give uh, at least the beginnings of an answer of how how we how we go about building a no borders movement and what people are are currently doing. Um, so I will, uh, I will hand things over to Nandita. Welcome, uh, Nandita. Hi, thank you, um, Simon. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for everyone at the ArtsLink um, uh, for organizing this. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'm going to share um, a PowerPoint presentation. So I'm gonna disappear from the screen. Um, for a while, or maybe not. Will I disappear or not disappear? We no, can you see you on the right-hand side. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, so nationalism, I, I'm sorry to assault you with this picture, um, but <laughs> I thought it was an appropriate place to start, which is that nationalism is inherently about separation. Um, as Benedict Anderson, uh, told us a long time ago, nations are not only imagined as communities, um, national communities are always imagined as limited. So no one nation encompasses all the world's people and in stark contrast to the, how imperial states um, acted, nation states don't want to incorporate all the world's people into their domain. 
uh, as Donald Trump puts it, uh, a nation without borders, all caps, is not a nation at all. Um, so let me just, uh, nationalism produces some, but never all people who live in its territory as a people. Uh, nation states are also reliant on naturalizing a link between a certain people and a certain place. Nation states therefore require the turning of land, water, and air into national territory. Those who are included in the nation therefore become a people of a place or more aptly a nation with a territory. Uh, now, of course, not all people are a people, uh, at least in the territories that they live in. So nationalism uh, turns those who are excluded from what Bridget Anderson terms the national community of value into a people out of place. So it's the figure of the migrant uh, which establishes the limits of the nation uh, and the migrant is always defined by lack, a lack of political status, a lack of national belonging, and a lack of a claim to territorial sovereignty. The jealous guarding of the nation's people and its place has become a virtue in, in our culture, in our laws, um, certainly codified in international law is the right um, that um, that one's rights in this global system of nation states are only as secure as one's relationship with the nation state whose territory you're on. So when people are excluded from the ever changing and ever narrowing criteria of national belonging, um, they are seen by many as threatening the nation's security. Now, ultimately, of course, what migrants threaten uh, is a security of nationalist identities, something that the national form of state power fosters in order to normalize its rule. So I wanna talk about a particularly powerful and also uncanny aspect of the you know, contemporary nationalist politics of separation. Uh, and it's the national borders that are erected between people who are constituted as either natives or as migrants. So while native, uh, it sounds kind of old fashioned when we think about it, but while natives um, who were, you know, the colonized people were once denied national status, right? They were often, cat we were often categorized as tribes, clans, you know, et cetera, unable and unsuited to wear the mantle of nationhood. Nativeness, uncannily, has increasingly um, become the real criteria for national belonging. Uh, so those who are categorized as migrants are defined as quintessentially out of place because they're seen as not, quote unquote, native to it. So separating people into these categories of natives and migrants is no trifling matter. Their separation has been and continues to animate uh, some of the most deadliest conflicts in the world today. Uh, so even before mass killings began in June 2012, uh, the separation of people into natives and migrants in Myanmar, formerly Burma, um, has been the ideological basis for what you know, most human rights observers believe is the world's most recent genocide. Not only is Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi silent about it, the quote unquote international community led by the United States and China have uh, largely ignored it. Uh, eager to normalize relationships with Myanmar um, and gain access to the estimated tens of billions of dollars worth of verified natural gas deposits found in the Bay of Bengal, um, where the targeted and supposedly migrant uh, Rohingya minority primarily reside. Little mention is made of how Myanmar has stripped Rohingya people of their citizenship supported the burning, looting, and killing of Rohingya people and their homes, and placed them in what you know a growing number of people classify as concentration camps. 
um, along with forcing hundreds of thousands um, uh, to flee Myanmar, all in the names of the indigenous rights of the native Burmese Buddhists in Myanmar. Uh, in the Darfur region of Sudan, a populist Save Darfur movement has successfully reframed the economic, ecological, and political legacies of European imperialism there into a conflict between supposedly indigenous Africans and migrant Arabs. And this has played directly into the hands of oil companies and further fueled, you know, the kind of Islamophobic uh, war on terror. Uh, in Rwanda, of course, in 1994, those acting in the name of native Hutus killed approximately 800,000 supposedly migrant Tutsis. Uh, the most potent and inflammatory label during the Rwandan genocide and the one that was most used to define the Tutsis was that of colonizer. Um, and in not dissimilar process took place in the 1991 um, to 2002 Yugoslav Wars, uh, where ideas of native belonging fueled the claims to Serbian, Croatian, and Bosnian homelands. Uh, those people who were targeted for quote unquote ethnic cleansing were defined as foreign elements who were out of place in other people's homelands. 140,000 people were killed and another 2 million people displaced in the process. The ideological basis for the forced expulsion of Asians from Uganda in 1972 was the indigenization of Black Uganda. Uh, claims to native rights to rule nation states also led to coup d'etats aimed at unseating quote unquote Asian parliamentary leaders in Fiji from the 1980s into the 2000s. Uh, and such a politics continues to shape violent xenophobic attacks on migrants in South Africa. Xenophobia, of course, also informs white supremacist panics, uh, moral panics about immigrant invasions across Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, as was made painfully clear in 2016 uh, when Donald Trump was elected US president and shortly thereafter erected a quote unquote Muslim ban. The politics of separating natives from migrants can also be seen in an increasingly popular discourse uh, in the United States, in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, the former, bright, the former British white settler colonies where the white in white settler colonialism has been dropped uh, amid a growing chorus of opinion that asserts that all people who are not native, including those who are racialized as black, Asian, or Latinx are settler colonists um, because they are migrants. Uh, indigenous activist Suckage Ward has even said that the quote, the label settler is too historically and politically sterile and that uh, migrants are nothing less than occupiers. In these reformulations across the world and across the left right political spectrum, migrants are held to be responsible uh, for the colonization of natives. And the stretching of the category of settler colonists to include those who were once expressly excluded from the white settler colonial project is a politics of centering um, indigenous sovereignty over land. Um, we can see this in Canada in the May 1981 adoption of the Ganawake Mohawk law and moratorium on quote unquote mixed marriages. Um, also known as the marry out, get out law, um, as well as in the efforts of the Cherokee Nation in the United States to expel Cherokee freedmen, who are the descendants of Black people that were held as slaves by Cherokees and brought with them on the Trail of Tears to the territories that were later defined as Cherokee National Territories. So, while these efforts of the Mohawks and the Cherokees were overturned by courts, they demonstrate not only the racialized basis for the idea of nationhood, 
but also the continuous process of culling. Um, each of them, of course, has their own specificities, but they are connected through what I call the discourse of autochthony, uh, in which the migrant or the figure of the migrant is defined as the barrier to the realization of native national rule. Um, and the fact that these autochthonous discourses are plausible and that they could do political work in a remarkably wide set of circumstances, ranging from the far right to social justice movements of some of the most subjugated and oppressed people on the planet, I think tells us something really important about the uh, uh, significance of a discourse of autochthony to the contemporary character of power. Now the term autochton uh, is derived from the Greek autos, which is self, uh, and ton, which is earth. And it literally means someone who has sprung from the earth and refers to an original or indigenous inhabitant of a place. Uh, many of the key classical Greek theorists, um, Homer, Socrates, Plato, uh, Aristotle, Euripides, all partook in the creation of a myth of autochthony as the basis of claims to rule. Um, like autochthony indigenous, the term indigenous also stems from classical Greek political theory. To be indigenous literally means to be born inside with the connotation in classical Greek at least of being born inside the house, which is, you know, i.e. being the master of a place. Um, those who are constituted as autochtons are seen to establish the limits of the political community. So they're, they're imagined to be rooted, this language of rooting uh, to particular lands, and as such, the only ones who have the inherent right to that place. Um, so Aristotelian metaphysics aside, the production of autochtons is both an historical as well as a relational practice. Autochtons uh, and their opposite, alectons, belong to particular kinds of societies. Alecton is predicated on the Greek alo, referring to that which is different, as well as the Indo-European alo, referring to someone or something else. Um, it was first used in geological references in the 19th century. To be alectonous was to be originating or formed uh, in a place other than where found. Originally, again, talking about rocks, but now talking about people. So in its modern usage, autochthony is founded on the ideological transformation of class into race. And it's these associations made most clear in the nationalist transformation of classes into masses that Hannah Arendt talked about that gives indigeneity so much of its political purchase today. Uh, the politics of autochthony rests on another unacknowledged ideological transformation, that that conflates human mobility with state-controlled migration. And a secondary conflation between processes of migration with processes of colonization. And that's what makes calling migration and calling migrants colonizers is what makes this politics of autochthony uncanny. Many of those, many of us who were once categorized as natives of various European colonies have become supposedly colonizers, sometimes of Europeans, which is really bizarre, but at other times of other colonized natives. So for a growing number of people and their political projects around the world, um, migration, whether it's real or imagined, whether it's today or thousands of years ago, has become tantamount to colonization, which I think is an incredibly dangerous move. Um, the separation of natives and migrants uh, is, I argue, an integral part of the post-colonial New World Order, in which the national form of state power has become hegemonic. Um, and uh, as much 
uh, you know, and created a new international and new interstatal regime of ruling. Uh, and post-colonialism, far from marking the end of the violent relationships of colonialism, instead marks the end of the legitimacy of imperial states and the ascendancy of the legitimacy of national states. Um, Post-colonialism, in my formulation, is a style of ruling uh, that actively subsumes the collective anti-colonial energies of people into a new separated world of nation states. Um, and in doing so has actually led to a containment of demands for liberation. So in the post-colonial new world order, both colonizers and natives have been remade into national subjects. Uh, uh, and you know, both have, for the most part, been successful in gaining a nationalized sovereignty. And together they have made, sorry, I'm a little off here. Together they've made a post-colonial new world order, wherein, again, as Benedict Anderson told us, nationness is the most universally legitimate value in the political life of our time. So I'm going to skip ahead here because I think I'm running out of space here, but we know that um, historical research has shown us that the process of making and limiting the nation has always entailed violence. Partitions and forced population transfers have been the order of the day and they continue. They appear to be a requisite part of the process of nationalizing people and territory a process that produces some people as a people of a place and others as a people out of place. Um, and to make common sense of this, to make this make sense to people, the two groups are rendered incommensurable, unable to embark on any kind of common cause. Uh, we only need to think of how crucial forced population exchanges were to the pr accelerated process of nation building after World War I and again after World War II to understand this. So we see this mass movement, mass forced migration of um, people from Turkey into Greece, people from, you know, proper Turks in Turkey, proper Greeks in Greece, pop proper Pakistanis in Pakistan, proper Indians in India, proper Jews in Israel, and so on and so on. And in, in addition to these partitions and population transfers, of course, was the attempted expulsion and later extermination of those who were defined as being out of place, as enemies of the nation. And this is again brutally evident in the world's latest genocide in Myanmar against Rohingya, people who have been defined as colonizing migrants. So limiting national belonging is not only achieved through these processes of violent, you know, migra forced migrations or extermination, probably the most important and, and far more banal to technology for the realization and uh, everyday production of post-colonial, of the post-colonial new world order are the enactment of citizenship and immigration controls preventing certain but not all people from entering national territory, all while deporting those who are denied lawful residency has been and remains an indispensable part of limiting national belonging. And indeed, immigration controls is what distinguishes nation states from imperial states. Imperial states did not have immigration controls. So they're a relatively recent phenomenon. So national borders are also the point at where a globally operative capital and the global system of nation states meet. Immigration controls fragment a global proletariat into separate national proletariats, each with its supposed own state and each competing with other national proletariats, right? The American proletariat competing with the Chinese proletariat is a common trope. Uh, in the United States today. 
Um, but it's also important to note that immigration controls are also very um, productive of creating differences within nation states, citizens, immigrants, temporary foreign workers, refugees, so-called illegals, and so on, not only mark a hierarchy of national statuses, they also operate as labor market categories. What, how much you're paid, whether you're able to organize into a labor union or access workplace protections and rights, all of them depend on which status you have been marked with by the nation state. So immigration controls and the anti-immigrant politics that animate them and legitimate them create highly competitive labor markets within nation states, precisely the thing that supposedly anti-immigrant politics is, is meant to remedy. They actually produce the competition that they claim to be trying to uh, remove. So um, I'm going to conclude by arguing that the dynamism of this post-colonial new world order is maintained through the continuous remaking of the national political body. Partitions, forced population transfers, expulsions, exterminations are not one-time events. They are continuously reenacted. Um, there's always new nations being formed, new national liberation movements being you know, formed and demanding their own territorial sovereignty. And that's because of the contradictions that are, that are inherent in any effort to nationalize people, right? Nation states always fall short of their promises. And those promises, when they fail, lead to further nationalisms, which you know Thomas and I were talking about yesterday as a paradox of this system that we live in. Um, so let me conclude by saying that a politics of no borders, so we can segue into the next discussion, a politics of no borders, which I have been active in since 1999 is when I first adopted a politics of no borders, understands that the historic and gross injustices that are done to people captured in these highly differentiated state categories of national, native, citizen, immigrant, et cetera, are intimately connected to one another, right? They can try and separate us through these state categories but we're not actually foreign to one another. We actually came into being side by side. You can't have a citizen without having a migrant and we can become inseparable if we choose to be. So I believe that rejecting a politics of nationalism and of nativism is crucial to our ability to not fall off the cliff, um, which, uh, you know, the, preface, the precipice of which we are all currently on. Thank you. Thank you, Nandita. That was that was excellent. Um, so now this is a great segue into the next uh, talk, which is uh, will be by Alex Sager, um, and um, he'll be giving a talk on no borders. Um, so thanks, Alex. Go ahead. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for organizing this. I'm just really delighted to be on this uh, panel. Um, what I want to do today is, is I want to share some insights uh, inspired by the, the anarchist uh, anthropologist uh, David Graeber, who um, re recently passed away. And um, I never had an opportunity uh, to, to meet him. But uh, for me, David Gra Graeber, he, he was a theorist of hope and possibility. And uh, he was the, the type of theorist that really enabled us to see the world differently and imagine how it could, could change. And you know, quite frankly, I think this week, uh, maybe these, these last few years, we can all use a little bit of hope. So I wanna use some of his, his work, um, particularly from a very short book, uh, Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology. Um, I wanna want use this to think about uh, alternatives to how nation states conceive of borders and to connect them to the arts link, link theme of uh, radical hospitality. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of uh, start with practice and, and work in, uh, into theory. So I'm going to start by setting up a problem um, and some of the ways that people in, in my own city of Portland, Oregon have responded. 
Um, so on June um, 17th, uh, 2018, um, occupiers set up camp at the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement headquarters in South uh, Portland. The occupation uh, was in response to the Trump administration's uh, separation of children. And it was also a response to the, the deplorable conditions in a uh, detention uh, center near, uh, in, in Sheridan, Sheridan, which is near uh, Portland. And this came uh, at a time of widespread outrage against the Trump administration's immigration uh, policies. And our, our mayor, uh, Ted Wheeler, he initially supported the occupation and declared that the Portland police would not interfere. Now, the protesters, they, they uh, succeeded in, in shutting down uh, headquarters until uh, June uh, 28th. And um, then federal uh, officers removed uh, the tents on the federal property and they, they arrested nine people. Uh, but the camp continued uh, beside uh, ICE until um, July 23rd when Mayor Wheeler, he, he changed course, course and supported uh, the then uh, Portland Police uh, Chief, uh, Daniel Outlaw. Uh, she's since moved on to Philadelphia and being in the headlines there. Uh, so she swept the camp. And the, the, the claim was, is that the camp was a fire and biomedical uh, hazard and it was blocking access to medical facilities. Uh, as far as I can tell, those claims were false, but by July 25th, uh, 2018, the occupation was over. Now, one lesson we can take from Occupy ICE, and I think the Occupy movement more generally, is that occupying space works only as long as the state is reluctant to use violence to disperse protesters. Uh, states have learned uh, that they can wait until people's attention has, has, has wavered or that the protests or the occupations lose popular support and then they send to the police. Now, of course, protests against uh, uh, ICE have not stopped. Uh, so there's a weekly ritual in Portland um, in which uh, protesters in gas masks uh, show up late in the evening at the ICE building uh, blasting music. Uh, sometimes they, they drive a, a toy Antifa tank and federal officers, they invariably come out and sooner or later they come out with tear gas, smoke grenades and rubber bullets and chase protesters through the neighborhood. So it's easy to despair here. Uh, the police, they're heavily militarized and they're uh, willing, I think even want to use force. Uh, the protesters have shown incredible resilience. Uh, there's a, a photo of a couple embracing in the tear gas uh, uh, nearby ICE. Uh, and um, nonetheless, I think many of them and many of the independent journalists who cover these protests every night, uh, they're going to suffer from long-term missed. Okay, so I want to shift away from local str struggles and kind of move to the larger picture. Um, I, I think we should abolish ICE. Uh, but it's only a piece in a much larger system. And we need a world um, that treats human mobility entirely different from the way states do. And let me just move to one more example. Uh, let's move from Portland to the English Channel. Um, you know, a, a, a tragic story, but in a lot of ways, a very, very familiar uh, story. I looked at the missing, missing migrant site that tracks, tracks uh, um, deaths along the migratory routes earlier this week. Uh, and for this year, the figure is uh, 2,421, at least as of Monday, it's probably a little bit higher now. Uh, last year, the figure was 5,319. Uh, the year before, it was 4,937. If we go back to 2017, the figure was 6,279, and so on. You know, this goes back decades. Uh, the state system and its insistence that sovereign states can restrict uh, migration, it reliably and predictably, predictably leads to thousands of deaths every year. And these are deaths that are widely reported, acknowledged, and then they're either ignored or um, quite often they're blamed on smugglers or blamed on the migrants themselves. And I guess what struck me about this was the response from, from liberal commentators. Um, you know, they, they largely focused on the need to create safe legal routes for refugees and other migrants. And again, 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 we hear uh, that there's the need to allow people to travel so that the claims for protection can be adjudicated by states. Uh, there's the, uh, the, the demand or uh, you know, the claim that there needs to be um, um, more resettlement of refugees. Uh, 
There needs to uh, be measures to facilitate family reunion, uh, measures to give temporary visas for workers so they can uh, travel legally. I don't really believe any of this is gonna occur. Um, and I, I don't think so because I don't think these deaths are a byproduct of state borders. I, I rather think they're, they're, they're part of a system and it's a system that has the dehumanization, the demonization and the criminalization of people at its core. I think you know something that uh, uh, unites uh, Nandita, Thomas, and I is we all oppose how states use violence to um, to um, illegalize people and criminalize mobility, um, and we reject carving the world up into citizens and non-citizens, sedentary populations who belong and migrants who do not. And this is an anti-racist and, and an anti-caste position. Uh, the very category of immigrant. Uh, it, it creates groups of people, um, usually through racialization, uh, with unequal rights, you know, for the purposes of exploiting and abusing them. Um, okay, so what are the implications of these views? Well, I don't think it's reform. You can reform something that's basically decent and useful, but institutions that exist to harm, to oppress, to exploit, they shouldn't be reformed. They should be abolished. Okay, so. We, we frequently hear that trying to create a world without state borders is naive, utopian, even irresponsible. You know, you, you get this in some activist uh, uh, circles. Um, and the objection isn't that this would be a world that would be hard to achieve. I mean, that's, that's clear, but uh, rather that it's, it's a world that cannot exist. Or um, if it is a world that can exist, it's not a world we want to live in. And this is where I want to turn to David Graeber's writings on anarchism. I take the core anarchist idea uh, to be that society should be organized on free agreement between people. And anarchists, uh, they, they, they recoil at the thought of using violence to kill, compel people to obey. Instead, they seek to persuade uh, people. So anarchism, it's, it's anti-hierarchical. Um, and on the positive side, anarchists believe in, in mutual aid. And Graeber, he has a section called Blowing Up Walls, which I took the title of this talk uh, from in, in Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology. He starts with a familiar dialogue between an anarchist and a skeptic. And uh, the skeptic's sympathetic to anarchism or says that she is, uh, but asks for uh, examples of societies run on anarchist principles. And the anarchist starts giving examples, examples of non-state societies, and worker cooperatives, the Paris Commune, Commune, the Spanish Civil War. In each case, the skeptic uh, rejects the example and says that either it doesn't work or uh, the, the attempt was either a failure. He wrote something I, I thought you know, really struck me when I first read it. Yeah, he, he, he wrote, the dice are loaded. You can't win. Because when the skeptic says society, what he really means is state, even nation state. Since no one is going to produce an example of an anarchist state, that would be a contradiction in terms. What we're really being asked for is an example of a modern nation state with the government somehow plucked away. And he goes on and writes, there is a way out which is to accept that anarchist forms of organization would not look like, look, would not look anything like a state. Now, my intention today isn't to endorse anarchism as a political philosophy. Uh, I do accept the anarchist conviction that there's a strong burden of proof on anyone who wants to justify using force in others. Uh, but I, I think I follow James Scott in giving two, not three cheers for anarchism. Uh, rather, what I wanna do is uh, uh, talk through some of anarchism's uh, implications for borders. If we try to build a world for human mobility that doesn't look like a state, what would it look like? And how would we, we get there? I'm just gonna make three kind of uh, modest points. So I pick, pick this slide because um, you know, waterways don't uh, respect state borders. And the first point is that um, though states try to remake the world in their own image, they never wholly succeed. I think this is uh, uh, echoes some of the things that Nandita has, has just told us. States, they, they expanded an enormous amount of energy and violence in maintaining their status. They create national education programs and national ce celebrations to indoctrinate people to their world way of seeing the world. Uh, they write, rewrite history in their attempts to create a homogenous national ethnic group. Uh, you know, we talked about forced expulsions of uh, groups, which is, is a major part of the creation of actual nation states. Um, 
Well, this is all, all, all true, but you know, um, let me just mention one more thing states do. They, they, they have the whole spectacle of border enforcement. And a part of this is to create an external enemy, to bring, bring people together and to blame their failures uh, uh, to provide their citizens with a, with a, with a decent life. So they, they scapegoat group, uh, scapegoat groups uh, uh, as part of creation, creating a national identity. Now, despite all the, these efforts and the resources and the violence that goes into this, uh, states always fail. They're unable to eradicate diversity. They're unable to stop people and ideas from crossing borders. They can only partially su suppress difference. And, um, you know, um, the, the magnificent complexity and diversity of people within their borders, uh, many who live transnational lives. So it's important to constantly remind ourselves how state narratives fail. They don't describe reality. Rather, they describe a reality that states hope to bring about. My second point is that borders only exist when we believe in them and accept them. Borders are social constructions. This doesn't mean they're not real. They constitute nation states. And they're maintained by bureaucracies and police forces. Uh, they have real, um, sometimes lethal effects. Nonetheless, their existence depends on our accepting them. We accept borders by assuming they are part of the so social fabric of reality and by treating as legitimate the armed police that enforce them. Enough of, of us were to stop doing this. They don't just become irrelevant. They actually cease to exist. Now, I, I don't wanna pretend for a moment that we can just imagine borders out of existence. There are people willing to use lethal force to maintain them. And here I'm reminded of uh, a Graver's essay, uh, Dead Zones of the Imagination, an essay on structural stupidity. And his topic here is bureaucracies and the combination of violence, uh, stupidity and lack of imagination that upholds them. Um, Graber observes, this is a quote, um, one of my favorite quotes is that violence is so often the preferred weapon of the stupid. And he says this because violence allows people um, with the power to inflict, inflict it to forego the interpretive na nature, or sorry, the interpretive labor necessary for human relations. He also uh, makes it clear that police are bureaucrats with weapons. So we shouldn't underestimate how fundamental borders are to our reality. At the same time, people resist and refuse them all the time. I think Thomas is gonna talk about some of this. Uh, the fact that there's so much of, of the violence is overt and lethal, it actually speaks to the fragility of borders and the fear that people in power have that they will dissolve. This brings me to my third point. No borders world is already here. There's a tendency to think that groups organized independently of states are something special. There's self-organized collectives or cooperatives or people who are trying to enact the type of world they hope to live in. I mean, all, all, all of that exists. Um, but you know, when we think about anarchist spaces in this way, they're, they're vulnerable. Squatters can be evicted with helicopters and tear gas. Uh, occupiers can be dragged into police vans. Um, Graeber's written eloquently about how the need to interact with bureaucracies can co-opt or even undermine uh, even things like anarchist uh, uh, direct action uh, you know, networks. Um, that said, much of our social lives are based on anarchists and no border principles. This is true not only of voluntary associations where nobody has the power to compel anybody to do anything else, it's also true of uh, many families, many, many schools, and oddly enough, any decent workplace where people work together for a shared purpose. Uh, friendships, special associations, families, they all cross state lines. Um, and um, if you just look around, there are examples of radical, unconditional hospitality and mutual aid, aid um, all around us. Uh, if we just open our eyes and see them. So right, right now we're taking part in an international arts festival. And what's notable about these associations is when you look carefully at them, they, they very rarely match the nation state's ideal of who belongs and who we are. Now, look, I, I don't wanna idealize human relationships. Um, I think human relationships, they fall, follow a law of entropy. It takes constant, constant interpretive and emotional labor uh, to lift people up. Some people are uh, bullies, some people are sadists and toxic, uh, behavior from a single individual can often undermine a group or an organization if it's not dealt with. Um, nonetheless, 
I think the tendency to despair sometimes leads us to ignore the many aspects of our social life that we should celebrate. And the question becomes, how can we build on these? We can refuse certain relations and um, institutions. The problem is, is that exit from these relationships and institutions have costs. And so any solution requires constructing institutions worth their alternative, requires constructing alternative institutions worth supporting. Let me just close with another quote from uh, Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology. Um, since anarchists are not actually trying to seize power with any national, within any national territory, the process of one system replacing the other will not take the form of sudden revolutionary cataclysm, the storming of a Bastille, the season of a winter palace, will necessarily be gradual. The creation of alternative forms of organization on a world scale, new forms of communication, new, less alienated ways of organizing life, which will eventually, currently existing forms of power seem stupid, I decide. I'd like to add and conclude uh, with the comment that some of this work will not be creating entirely new uh, institutions, but amplifying the best of what we already have. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, that was, that was great. Um, and that, that um, I think speaking of alternative institutions and uh, gradual changes, um, that is the topic of, 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 of my presentation. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and set my timer here. Um, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, my name's Thomas and uh, I'm a political philosopher um, and I, I don't think I've ever been in favor of borders, but I have, um, uh, I got into studying no borders and thinking very seriously about that as a political uh, position when I uh, did a, I spent a year as a Fulbright scholar at the universe uh, and in Toronto to work with the migrant justice group no one is illegal um, about a decade ago in 2009 and 2010 for a year um, and the reason I went there was because I, I I was I was doing political theory and I found that political philosophers had very little to say about borders and migration. Uh, which struck me as very weird because it seemed like such an absolutely central part of political theory um, for very few, not none, but very few political philosophers to take that seriously um, as, as, as a deep aspect of political theory. A lot of liberal political theory just focuses on uh, the assumption they start with nation states and then try to figure out, and well, there's exceptions here and problems here and, you know, migrants don't totally fit but you know we'll account for them by these measures or whatever um and i felt that that was giving up too easily and so i spent that year um working with and and, and writing about uh migrant justice movements um and and the outcome of it was that i wrote two books one was called the figure of the migrant in 2015 and the other called theory of the border in 2016 and the project was just to try to rethink political theory from 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 the beginning i mean to go back and assume that 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 people move and that migrants are primary they're constitutive and and that all other terms are uh, and states themselves and societies are meta stable states um, like an eddy and a river or something they are emergent features uh that that are produced by human migration um and so uh sort of yeah taking the migrant to be a constitutive figure of societies and then and writing from there um, so that's that's where I'm coming from. Uh, that's 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 my background and motivation there. Um, but I do I I just want to echo something from the other day that when Nandita and I were talking is that we really are at a tipping point. I mean, it is not a coincidence. It is not a weird random thing that we're here talking to you today about no borders politics. This is really a lot more scholars are writing about this. A lot more political philosophers are writing about borders and migration now than they were a decade ago. And a lot more people are talking about no, no borders now for a very good reason, um, because at the very same time that we're talking about no borders, we're also living at a dramatic tipping point where nation states are becoming increasingly more violent, uh, that nationalisms are ramping up around the world uh, we it, that global inequality uh, is absolutely enormous at record levels. One percent of the population owns more uh, uh, is is wealthier than the the rest of the entire world combined. That is that's outrageous. Like how could that possibly be fulfilling the ideals, the premise of the nation state, which was supposed to have every group in their place and them all have self you know autonomy and 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 equality. Uh, that is not what we've witnessed. The project of nation states is dying, and 
Uh, I, yesterday, Simon was going to hold me to defining nation post-nationalism uh, today, and I, I, I don't think post-nationalism means we're out of the, that the nation state is gone, um, but I do think it means that uh, it's just a critical designation. Uh, the post means we're not sure what to do after this, but something is in crisis, and there's not yet another word for what will come after. And so I take a very negative definition of, of, of that word. Um, in the 21st century, we are dealing with problems that just can't be handled by nation states, global climate change. It's not something easily solvable by just by thinking about things in terms of nation states. The incredible amount of human migration is, 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 is a product of nation states. It will not go away. Hannah Arendt was absolutely right in her original designation. This is the fun, a fundamental problem of the nation state. No solution to mass global migration is going to come from the nation state itself. Um, so we, there are over a billion migrants today. Uh, at, this is, there are more migrants now than ever in recorded history. Um, and that number is just keeps getting larger and larger. Uh, the percentage um, migration has risen by nearly 50% since the turn of the 21st century. And more than 56,000 migrants have died or gone missing worldwide over the last four years. Um, and that number is just keeps increasing. I remember following these numbers for just for, for years and, and just keeping track like Alex of, of how many people, how many migrants were dying either in the desert and crossing the US-Mexico border or, or crossing the Mediterranean and just being horrified on a regular basis and political theorists not talking about this as a structural problem. Um, and the news media and politicians not knowing what to do. They're like, well, we can't, they realize at a certain level, you can't really stop those deaths without seriously questioning the conditions under which those people are killed murdered by borders. Uh, and that is the best the, the structure of the nation state itself. Um, in any case, those those are are problems that are that are that are structural. Um, and climate change is not going to decrease that it is only going to increase it. Uh, some projections are that international migration may double in the next 40 years. Um, and we're already beginning to see uh, uh, a lot of migrants that are are moving related to climate changes. Uh, and those are never just climate changes because the climate changes are always politically related. Certain groups are situated uh, in worse places and under worse conditions than others. Um, and at the, so at the same time as the nation state is, is failing to live up to its expectations, uh, we're seeing, uh, 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 you know, like Nandita was saying, this is like this, this paradox, which is that there's large groups. I mean, this is the dominant movement, a doubling down at the moment of crisis where we would expect there to be some kind of change in order to deal with these problems, we're getting reactionism. We're getting uh, right-wing nationalism, xenophobia, crackdown, like massive rigidification of borders all around the world. Um, especially, I mean, we could start just by looking at, you know, when we could start post Berlin Wall, but definitely since uh, the, the, the terrorist attacks of 9-11, uh, the, the Syrian refugees, uh, borders are being built just like crazy. I mean, they are multiplying. There's never been this many borders, uh, this many walls. So just for example, 30 years ago, um, at the fall of the Berlin Wall, there were only 15 walls in the world. And the fall of the Berlin Wall was supposed to be this big moment of, well, we're going to, you know, communism is over, the walls are going to end, and, you know, capitalism will free up everything and make everything move mo mobile. Uh, well, it certainly let itself, made itself mobile. Um, it moved, it, it was able to move around, it moved across borders, capital flowed, uh, and human bodies were criminalized. And now there are over 70 walls. So just this is this is a trend that keeps going, and this is all, these walls are all examples of people committed deeply to the nation state. I mean, this is Trump's, you know, not that he himself is, I think, cogent enough to have much of a political project, but this is the project he stands for: is a a re entrenchment of the nation state, as if that will solve the problem. But like Nandita was saying, this is not anything original or novel. Uh, this is this is just this is how this is how nation states work. They will, we won't give up on the project. The answer is always let's double down again instead of coming up with something new. Um, so it's, it's not surprising then. And, and uh, this is one of the biggest industries, the biggest growing industries right now in the world uh, is the security industry of building borders, uh, both to securitize migrants and also to build walls and barriers uh, uh, regard, you know, walls around cities for, for, for rising tides and uh, due to climate change, 
$742 billion this industry is projected to, uh, to, to, to be valued at that by 2023. That is very soon, but this has been going on for a while. There are a lot of companies with a lot of interest in detention, deportation, wall building. Uh, people are getting very wealthy and they have a vested interest in, me, in, in, in becoming increasingly wealthy. And the way that they're doing that is by securitization. And there are lobbying politicians who then stoke fear and people become afraid of climate migrants and so-called barbarians. Uh, they're afraid that you know global capitalism is stealing their jobs, which in some case may actually be happening. They are afraid of global poverty. That is very much a real thing, but they are blaming immigrants and they're blaming foreigners like Nandita was saying, that's exactly where we're at. Um, and there are some people that are absolutely making billions of dollars uh, and elsewhere I've written, I've called them the, the climate migration industrial complex uh, for this vast industry that is making tons of money and lobbying to keep itself in, 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 in business. Yes, so the borders, these, the, they're an industry. They don't really stop human movement. I mean, people, people are always moving. And these borders, all of the studies show, I mean, whatever you hear on the media, whatever you hear elsewhere, your relatives on holidays, I don't know where people are saying that these borders are very effective and we just need more of them. Actually, they're very ineffective. They're extremely ineffective. Uh, the, 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 the odds of, of crossing the US-Mexico border, just for example, is 90% success rate on the third time. Uh, people cross these borders, but the very dangerous thing is that these borders kill people. Uh, all of the, that's, that's what they can do. Um, they very much kill people. They destroy the environment. They break all kinds of laws. Um, but they don't actually keep people from moving. Um, sometimes when, when, when people ask me what a no borders world would look like, I mean, not in full seriousness, but I often say, well, it would look a lot like it is now because the walls aren't really stopping anybody. So if they're coming anyway, the thing that it would actually do is, is reduce an incredible amount of unnecessary human suffering and death. 7,500 people, more than that, have died trying to cross the US-Mexico border since 1994. I mean, people are dying in the desert trying to cross because they're funneled, they're funneled in. When the cities are fortified and the desert is laid open, they go right into the funnel, which is called the Devil's Highway, and they, and they die um, in large numbers. And that would stop uh, the criminalization, the incarceration, the detention and deportation. All of that would stop. But in terms of people that are here, they're going to be here, um, and, and people are going to move. Um, so anyway, my, 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 that's, that's my short framing of this problem. And, the, and, and, and most of the substance of my paper is the question of no borders. I mean, it's, it sounds like we've said, it sounds like this abstract idea that sounds very utopian. Um, and in some ways, I think it is a very radical claim, but I don't think that we're going to get there overnight. In fact, yeah, just especially this week, it feels that we are farther than ever from uh, from, from, from achieving anything like that. Um, but I, I, I think that it is a project worth undertaking and considering at every stage uh, how we might get there. Um, and, and all of the work that people are doing right now that are, that are moving us forward in that struggle. So it's not an abstract idea. Um, I think it's pretty unlikely that if we all stood with signs that said no borders now, that the government, if with enough lobbying or enough signatures, we could we could somehow convince the the government or the nation state, you know, like Nandita was saying, this is weird, you know, or actually like Alex was saying, both of them really, that there's this paradox. It's like, you know, imagining a nation state without borders. What I mean, there's there's something deep like that's that just twists your mind because like, well, how could it be a nation state without borders? Exactly. Um, it wouldn't be a nation state anymore. And that's what's being asked for. So when you ask the nation state to remove its own borders, you're asking for it to like cut off its head or to dismantle itself. Um, and so the, the radical nature of that, of that claim starts to, to become apparent very quickly of what that would mean. And I think it's extremely unlikely that if we just yell loud enough, the state will somehow abolish its own borders. And so if that's not going to happen, and I think it's really uh, unlikely, and that's not really how things end up changing anyway, uh, the real struggles are grassroots struggles from the bottom up of people doing everything they can where they're at to build communities that will that resist the nation state at all these different levels. And so those are some of the practices I want to talk about uh, today. Um, and I, I, I do want to say that just because Alex was mentioning this as well, but that ArtsLink is an interesting institution that it um, it I think it appreciates that 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 community building across nation states. 
um, that 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 wants to live in that world where artists can be together and that we can all be together and, and engage in mutually beneficial projects without the burden of nations. Uh, it's a brilliant idea, and it would be great if there were if if everybody had if ArtsLink was was everywhere, and that this wasn't only. Uh, for some groups of people, but right now that's where we're at and that's the struggle we face. So um, I wanna talk about maybe just sort of define um, and give some examples of some key terms that I think it's important to keep, uh, uh, to be aware of as part of, maybe not necessarily part of, but very much conditions for a no border politics. Um, and part of that struggle are sanctuary, um, and solidarity um, and status. And none of those, I don't want to say, none of those are, and then at the very end, if, if I have time, I'll talk about um, no borders and what that might mean once we get there. But I think that's not where we start, even if it's the aims, it's not where we're at right now. We have a long way to go. Um, so the first the first term um, on the way there is sanctuary. And maybe you've heard this in the news and, and folks are familiar with sanctuary or sanctuary cities. Uh, that's a tricky term because it doesn't actually have a, universal meaning. What, what sanctuary is means something at different places. People use it very differently. There's not a universally accepted definition of what a sanctuary city is or a sanctuary campus. Um, uh, but what was very interesting is that during Trump's, uh, uh, during Trump's presidency, there, were, it, there was an enormous rise in the abolish ICE movement. I never thought that I would see that. I mean, being an activist, I thought, well, this is pretty far off and and especially Toronto was quite radical compared to what was happening in the United States. But now coming back to the United States and being in Denver, I was blown away to go to a protest downtown in Denver and to see everybody wearing abolish ice t-shirts. Ice uh, yeah, like Alex is saying, it's not, uh, that's not the end of it, but that was a very impressive step. I didn't think we'd see, we'd see so quickly, but we are seeing the rise of a number of sanctuary movements, especially after Trump's uh, travel ban. A lot of people responded with uh, claims of sanctuary and that was so inspiring to see, but, they, but it, it produced this debate about what a sanctuary city actually was and what it meant to offer sanctuary. So let me just try to define that along a spectrum. Uh, the most minimal thing that I think you that people call sanctuary or a sanctuary city is just that the local law enforcement uh, does not cooperate with federal immigration enforcement. And they might be doing that for totally selfish reasons, like it's cheaper uh, because they don't have to pay and invest and do a bunch of work and fill up their jails and wor worry about, you know, all the all the costs and extra labor that's going to cost. So they just don't do it because it benefits them. Um, uh, but federal immigration can always show up. So the, the minimal definition is to, for that cities might call themselves sanctuary because their local law enforcement don't ask uh, anybody for documentation of citizenship. And that status is not something that will be asked for. And if it is discovered, it will not be used against them. Um, that's the minimal definition of sanctuary. Further steps, I mean, some cities, so example like Denver, Denver is not technically does not call itself a sanctuary city. Uh, and our mayor got a little bit of flack when people asked like, are, are we a sanctuary city? Because if we're not, we definitely should be right now because it's very important. And he was very resistant uh, to call it that, but he said a local law enforcement does not cooperate with federal immigration. So that's a step and it's very important because it allows migrants and undocumented people to report crimes uh, without fear of retribution uh, and being deported for reporting a crime. In any case, the, the sanctuary cities Holy cow, that can't possibly write. I only have four minutes. I'm never going to get through this. My apologies. Um, I talked too much about the framing. And Okay, so very quickly, sanctuary city can mean very minimal things about just not cooperation. Um, at the large, at the, at the kind of most intense ex degree, so there are sanctuary cities like San Francisco um, and Toronto that want to push that much farther than just saying we're not going to criminalize uh, and, and cooperate, but we're actually going to provide city services um, possibly the right to uh, to vote in the case of, of local elections, uh, to offer, it was on the ballot uh, recently in Denver to provide insurance and health care for undocumented people. It didn't pass, but those kinds of efforts at the city level to go beyond just, well, we won't cooperate to, we're actually going to treat you like you live here, like you're one of us and that we will not uh, we will provide all the city services that we can for you, um, be those from the city itself or institutions that are alternative inside of the city. So food banks um, uh, uh, to, to not cooperate and not, not scare uh, undocumented people away. Um, I think those are movements in the right direction to uh, create spaces, to create campuses that explicitly call themselves sanctuary 
uh, in an increasing spectrum of solidarity with those people. Uh, no More Deaths is a movement that provides water and food for people at the border. Um, and there's a number of, of other organizations that I was going to mention, but I'm, I'm running out of time now. But I did want to talk about uh, uh, the final point, which was about status, is that I think much well before we're going to see any movement for the abolition of status as such, I think it's probably at least one step along the way to advocate for universal status, even though that's a very, that's again, like one of these, that's toward the very end. Once there's a large movement of solidarity and sanctuary that people can then argue for the increasing range of status so that it becomes something that everybody has regardless of who they are. But then once you reach that paradoxical moment where everyone has status, you're really at the limits of now the nation state because once you everyone has it, it's sort of like it doesn't matter anymore. And that I think those are some of the final stages that would get us to no borders. But I also have to say in my very few, my one remaining minute actually, which is about no borders um, policies more broadly is that I think it's not just enough to, to, to abolish borders um, because this uh, abolishing borders might actually result in people from other countries, uh, I mean, more of them moving to Western developed countries and not that that is bad for for, 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 uh, for other countries who are losing those, those immigrants and those people, but it's also just in the interests of those Western countries to make a ton of money and profit off of all of those immigrants. And they do increase jobs and GDP and wages. They have benefits, almost universal benefits for receiving countries. Um, and I don't think that's the story that we should be telling about open borders. Like let's have open borders so wealthy countries can become wealthier. I think that another, this is again, at the very end of the, of the spectrum of how far we can push things is that we, we we, we have to abolish capitalism. I don't think that this, I don't think no borders and I don't think global equality is gonna be compatible with capitalism as a structure. There will, if there, as long as there's wealth asymmetries and inequality, people are going to be forced to move and they're not wanting to move, they will be forced to move. And that's not, again, the idea of open borders that the border should be open and people should be forced to move. No, people should not be forced to move, but the conditions of their forcible removal have to do with the distribution of global capitalism. So that also is entailed in no borders. Um, I'm, I'm out of time, but I hope that I've tried to take you from the beginnings of offering sanctuary to uh, where I think this leads or can lead anyway, is to a, a, a world without nation states, without borders and without capitalism. Um, or I think our, 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 the aspirations won't, won't be completely filled until all of those, those things are gone. Anyway, thanks, thanks for your time. And uh, if you have questions for, for any of us, please do um, put those in the, the Q&A section and we can go through those. So at this point, I'll invite uh, Alex and Andita back to uh, show, show themselves and we can have a conversation about um, these topics. Um, and you all can add things in the q and I'm not seeing any Q&A yet. Um, so I will just, at this point, open it to um, uh, Nandita and Alex to, if you all have any questions or reflections or any things you wanted to add to your own presentation or, or, or any of ours. You know, I think it's important for us to understand that migration and, and the growth of migration uh, you know, uh, with the advent of neoliberalism, really, right? Like we've seen actually a growth in migration precisely when neoliberal reforms were being made to national policies, uh, you know, starting in the 1960s, uh, but certainly after the 1980s. But one thing to recognize is that migration is actually a symptom of the failure of the nation state system, right? Because if nation states promise, right, that if you're part of the national community, you will be taken care of, you know, all your needs will be met, you will be free, you know, all of that stuff. Migration shows us that nation states are failing, right? And, and it also shows us that the system of nation states, like the promise of the system is also sovereignty, right? That each state is somehow completely uh, independent in its decision-making process than every other nation state. And that's a lie too, right? Like it's, uh, it's a system that is hierarchical. Some nation states have more powers than others and they, that's always been the case and it will remain the case. So it's also, a, you know, migration, the patterns of migration are also a symptom of that hierarchy within that global system of nation states, right? Like where people 
um, want to move to, whether they're able to get there or not, where people want to move to is dictated by where the wealth and the power flows up into the system and where it's taken from, right? So that's also really important to pay attention to. That it is, you know, I guess a shorthand is migration is structural to this system, right? We act like it's an aberration, like people, why are people moving? I don't know. Like it's actually part of the structure of the, of the failure of this system. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for saying that, Nandita, because I think that's 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 the thing that's so insidious. I mean, and we you know, there's the, the, the migration crisis and the migration problem. And like one way is to go back to the beginning and be like, actually, you know, this isn't really a problem for Western countries. They like put on this big fuss and pretend like it is They're like, oh, no, we don't want any immigrants, even though our entire economy depends on them. And if it if we didn't have them, everything would fall apart and we wouldn't be as wealthy as we were like that idea of. Of, of mobilizing people through colonialism and then criminalizing them once they arrive. I mean, it's, it's I don't wanna say the perfect system, but there's something deeply conspiratorial sounding about it, that they're actually producing the displacements that they can then criminalize and then exploit and charge, you know, and, and pay them nothing or deport them and abuse them and then have their entire economy lifted up by them. And then the whole time fussing, that's why I think like, the right wing xenophobia works perfectly well with the capitalists who can who can stand back and say, you know, the the, the Bill Gates and the Googles, but we're not racist. We 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 employ lots of immigrants, and and then when you know when Trump's travel ban goes through, it's like, no, he's the racist. He's the one, you know, keeping people out. It's like actually, you all are working together. This is benefiting both of you deeply, and you know it. Um, and you're putting on this show for us that you the, the 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 xenophobic right thinks like oh you know we're just we're just trying to protect our interests like actually if you got what you want you completely destroy your own country and the capitalists think they're not racist like actually everything you're doing is predicated on the racists who are criminalizing and racializing these people and it's like really too perfect of a system in that way but in the worst possible way um, so yeah I think it's not accidental I think it's not a a crisis for them. It's actually very much the, the business as usual. Yeah. And, and it's a fool's game, right? Like this is the this is the terrible, terrible irony of it that the enormous violence that the anti-immigrant you know politics creates, right? Um, fails the people who are actually, you know, the kind of foot soldiers of that politics, right? If, if anti-immigrant politics is supposed to protect, protect our jobs and increase our wages and ensure better social services and all of that rhetoric, actually anti-immigrant politics is what is driving wages down, right? Because there is no solidarity between people across these categories. Like, the quickest way to increase our wages and our rights as workers is to act in solidarity with those who are given less than we are, not to push those people further down, right? So it's it's a fool's game on top of all the craziness. Mm -hmm. Alex, did you, did you, did you, go ahead. I was gonna say, I, I think I saw, I, I see some questions in the question and answer. Uh, Oh, okay. Yes. Um, so there was one, the first one was not a question, but a, a nice suggestion about uh, conflict management uh, courses. Uh, but the second one is uh, from Emma. Do you think the concept of diaspora provides an opportunity to think about how the notion of belonging could potentially transcend beyond borders? Or does the discourse of diaspora, particularly given its association with remittances and the political capital of dual nationality, merely reinforce the idea of the nation of the nation state. Yeah, I personally don't like the concept of diaspora and in part because it is based on the idea that we are all from some place, right? So I often get categorized as part of the Indian diaspora and, and the Indian government loves this term precisely for the reasons that Emma outlines here, right? The remittances, the political support for politics in India, it's, you know, political parties in India, et cetera. But it presumes that I will always be associated with some other place than where I actually live and, and am, right? And so it kind of 
concretizes culture in a way that's not real, right? Like I will forever be Indian and the Jewish diaspora will always be, you know, based on this, the, the Chinese diaspora, the Mexican diaspora, like it's still rooted in this idea that each quote unquote people has their own place in the world. And I think that idea creates a lot of violence and it creates a lot of hierarchies because if you if you're part of the diaspora, then you're not really part of where you are. And I, I don't like that idea. But one last thing, Avtar Bra, who is a very interesting theorist, wrote a book called um, Cartographies of Diaspora, where she argues rather than associating the concept of diaspora with you know, racialized, ethnicized groups, we actually say that spaces are diasporic, right? So for example, you know, she, she uh, worked and was writing about England um, and, you know, she was arguing that England is a diasporic place, right? That it is a space that has been fundamentally shaped historically and today by a variety of ways of being, ways of eating, ways of thinking, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than thinking of people as diasporic, we could think of spaces as diasporic. That's a cool idea, Dita. I hadn't come across that, but I, I like that idea very much. But I have maybe a, I don't know, maybe a stupid question, but I haven't really seen um, uh, Mexican immigrants in America called diasporic. And it's just now occurring to me that that is kind of strange because the country in the world that has the largest percentage of its population outside of its own country is Mexico. And but and yet there's no diaspora. But I don't I don't know why that that I mean, the literature just gets called something else. But I don't know. Do you have any sense of why that is? Yeah. As soon as I said it, I thought, oh, that does sound kind of weird because I've never heard of that. Right. So uh, it may have something to do with the imagination of uh legal versus unlawful migration i don't know like obviously we know that most mexican migrants are lawful lawful permanent residents uh, mm -hmm. uh etc but so i don't know what, what do you think i i don't know i have no idea i mean all i can think of is that it might be related to uh asylum versus economic immigration i, I don't really know that for a fact but when i think about diaspora i mean you know, we, we both of us have spent time in Toronto, but there's a lot of diasporic, self-proclaimed diasporic communities in Toronto that use that term and that that literature I, speaks to them. And there was lots of conferences while I was there about that diaspora. Um, but the, oh, for some reason, the question is only now occurring to me now how, how different that is in the case of, of Mexicans in the United States um, who don't who don't call themselves diasporic. But maybe it's because, but many of them are fleeing forms of political violence, but that that's not the, the reason they were admitted, possibly. It wasn't because of political violence or religious persecution or whatever, like the Tibetan diaspora in Toronto, for instance. That's very, it's a very politically charged uh, group, a diasporic group. Anyway, I don't know, Alex, what do you do? You... Well, I, I think there, there's probably something to do with the complex history between uh you know, the, the, the U US and Mexico and, you know, the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, the borderlands have been bicultural and binational and very fluid for, for a long time and continue to be so even, you know, given the wall and all of that. Um, also say, I, I mean, Mexico is very complex and there, there's a lot of very, I think, different um, um, migrant, um, pathways between, you know, Mexico and the United States, uh, you know, in, in Oregon, for example, you know, we get a lot of different groups from Oaxaca that, you know, have been long-standing, uh, uh, formerly circular migration, but obviously that's that's changed for because of the border enforcement. Um, I, I would say, I remember living in, in New York and um, being aware of uh, how aggressively the Mexican state was actually interacting with uh, a lot of groups largely from Puebla. Uh, you know, uh, living in, in New York uh, City. And uh, there, there was some, some more kind of the traditional kind of nationalist diasporic politics in, in which, uh, you know, people in New York were intervening in politics in Mexico and were being, being recruited. So I think there's a bit of complexity uh, there. And so something about, you know, and this is, I think, one of the dangers of nationalism that we, you know, we take a category like Mexico and we pretend, you know, you can really talk about, you know, 
one group of people where it's incredibly diverse, uh, both uh, uh, ethnically and culturally, and of course, in terms of class, uh, you know, as, as, as well. Um, maybe just uh, something, something to, you know, Emma's uh, uh, question, because I, I, th I think it's really, a, it's, it's a great question. And I, I share a lot of the skepticism about how di diaspora is mobilized by nation states as a way of, you know, claiming, uh, may I'll even say ownership, you know, of, of people. I, I do though think it, it, it introduces a useful notion of complexity uh, because even though, you know, nation states like to pretend that, you know, they have a claim to people, this is never entirely true in reality. And, you know, it, it does speak to the ways that our, our identities are complex and often transnational. And I think we can focus on those, those aspects. And I, I think it can sometimes be useful of, you know, breaking out of this framework, you know, where you have this sort of homogenous, uh, you know, national uh, ethnic group. So I'll put that out there. Well, there are no, no questions in the box, but I, but I, I feel like we're missing some hard question thrown at us about no borders. I, I feel like we're getting off too easy with this almost. Um, and so I, maybe I'll just ask it to you all, which is uh, when we read this stuff in the classes that I teach, inevitably some student says like, well, if the borders were open, wouldn't people just flood in uh, to the United States and Europe and wouldn't it overcome those countries and wouldn't they unable to provide uh, to s services and wouldn't basically the society be over overburdened with uh, with migrants moving in uh, very suddenly and wouldn't that be a reason not to to open borders that there'd be suddenly tons of people moving around and it would undermine the stability of of Western nation states. Well, I, I could say something <laughs> to that. I, I mean, I, I think one thing people you know, places like the United States assume is they assume that everybody wants to live here. People, people don't. I mean, some people do. And, you know, we talked about some of the structural reasons why uh, people are compelled uh, to migrate. But I, I, I think uh, a, a lot of nation states really overestimate, you know, how attractive they are, uh, you know, to the rest of the world. Um, you know, the, the, the other just thing to, to point out is that if this were really the case, why would people migrate? You know, it just assumes that, you know, people don't have decent reason for migrating. And usually when people, you know, you actually look and you ask people, you know, why, why they migrate, uh, they, they often have reasons, you know, beyond, you know, people don't just migrate anywhere. They don't just say, okay, I can make more money in, you know, X country, I'm gonna move there. Usually they have ties, they have community connections, they have families, uh, you know, they, they have pretty strong reasons. You know, the slide I showed uh, of people, you know, crossing the English Channel. You know, you often hear this kind of refrain, you know, why would anybody, you know, move from, you know, France to England? Uh, you know, they're surely, France is wonderful, but you know, that there's people in you know, refugee camps in, in France that desperately want to go to Europe, uh, England. Why? Well, they have ties there. They speak the language, they have, you know, they're, they're, they're reasons. So, you know, if everybody assumes this is the case, I, when you actually look at the evidence, there's not a great deal of evidence that suggests this would actually occur. I, I think sometimes it, it actually is, is, well, I'll just say it. I think sometimes it's actually kind of a racist fantasy. You know, there's the, the Jean Raspail book, what is it, The Camp of the Saints? You yeah. know, this kind of far extreme right, you know, literature where this is portrayed and you know, this, this is a fantasy. There's, there's not, not that much evidence that it's actually going to occur. It's kind of a disturbing one. Yeah, I mean, I also think that um, uh, the, the question that gets posed, when the question is posed that way, it's a question that is actually literally stating that we don't want to share with the rest of the world the wealth that we have hoarded in the United States. Right? That's also what is being said when that question is being asked. And I think what we, we you know, one way of answering that question is that um, we would prevent, you know, this, this kind of bulging movements if the wealth of the world was equally shared, right? So that, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. You can't just say, I want 80% of the world's wealth 
consumed by, you know, 20% of the world's population in the rich world, right? And I, I also want that other 80% of the world to just leave me alone and just go away. You don't get to have it both ways, right? And that is why, you know, people who want it both ways call migration a crisis. It is not a crisis. Migration is a solution to people's needs. It is a survival mechanism. And the reasons that they are forced into such precarious survival strategies is what needs to be addressed. And so, you know, you can say, I don't want to let anyone into the United States, but that has to come with the political acknowledgement that you also want to hoard the world's wealth for yourself. And you don't care one iota about social justice, right? You don't care one iota about, about what is happening. So one of the things that I would say is that I do disagree with some no borders um, theorists. I don't think this is, you know, I don't, yes, people are definitely challenging borders. And in that sense, it's a practical, you know, reality of today, but it's also a revolutionary practice. This is not just some kind of tinkering at the edges of the system. This is an absolutely revolutionary politics, right? And I think the sooner we acknowledge that, the sooner we can get away from like, oh, this isn't practical. It's like, yeah, it's a revolution, right? So we're talking <laughs> about fundamentally transforming class relationships, gender relationships, I, our own imaginations. Like, I don't belong to a race of people because there is no races. I don't belong to a nation because there are no nations. Like, you know, we need, we need a way of thinking and a way of organizing the world that corresponds to our actual reality. And that's not the world that we have today. Our world is like a veil. Every single part of our world is a veil to justify hoarding um, and call it scarcity and then push everyone away by saying, oh, sorry, we don't have enough when we're actually doing all the hoarding. Yeah, thanks, Dandita. That's very well said. And I think that's, I mean, if I was only shortly respond and add to what you all are saying, I mean, there's a way in which somebody put in the, the Q&A, you know, like a 10th grader responded, how, if there's no borders, how will we protect ourselves? Uh, but the question's not they asked the other way around is how will those people be safe? Um, but also like by by say, by framing it of like, well, we couldn't do that because then they would come. And as you said, take our things. There's an implicit, I think it's a very uncomfortable question because what they're essentially saying, like you're saying, Nandita, is I would rather see thousands of people die with their bleached bones in the desert than I would give up anything of what I currently have based on the history of colonialism. That's another thing that we didn't really talk about, or we kind of touched on it, but I just, I know we're sort of wrapping up here, but I would say that we absolutely, that colonialism is not gone. Like we live in that legacy. And one, one, one justification for no borders is, is partly just has to do with, with a kind of reparations, like a kind of transformation that, uh, uh, that, we benefit by colonial power. We benefit by the history of col colonization. We can't just say, well, let's just bracket that because those were dead ancestors of ours that did that. Now let's start again with everything we have and pretend like we didn't steal it and aren't still stealing it. Uh, I think that's, I think it's, yeah, it pushes that button and people often get very upset very quickly when asked to do that. Um, so there is one very last, uh, one very one last question. And Simon says, we have, we have time to take it. Um, uh, it says, oh, this is from Emma again. Uh, she says, okay, a harder question then, uh, given you asked one. Uh, even though borders are clearly socially constructed, doesn't the fact that they emerge repeatedly throughout hi human history demonstrate that although they fluctuate throughout time and space, they represent a human desire for enclosure and the fundamental need for so many to belong to a particular place? Yeah, I would say like, you know, uh, one way to answer that question is that borders, like the cons or a better way of putting it actually is constraints on human mobility, right? Constraints on human mobility are a part of state societies. State societies, according to many scholars, I'm thinking particularly of James Scott, um, state societies are about 5,000 years old. Right, Homo sapiens, which is what we are today, 
Homo sapiens are over 200,000 years old. So of that 200,000 years, we've had 5,000 years of state societies which try and constrain people's mobility. So it's not human nature. It is not a natural aspect of you know, wanting to um, have a firm sense of identity, having you know, an association with particular places. The constraints on human mobility are part of ruling relationships. People don't constrain their own mobility. Uh, people's mobility is constrained um, by those who benefit from it, right? They benefit from the constraint of our mobility through slavery, um, through immigration controls, et cetera. So I think that one definitely starting point of a no borders politics is to acknowledge um, how, how, how closely linked constraints to human mobility are going against human nature, right? They, they are forced on us. They're not part of who we are. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Alex, did you, did you wanna answer that as well or? Well, yeah, yeah, I would just, just add, I, I mean, I think I'm gonna make an important point. I mean, place matters, uh, but I, I don't think a no borders politics or an open borders politics says that anybody should not be allowed to cultivate and build a, a place in a community. Um, and, you know, pe people are often, and in the world we have right now, I mean, people are often forced to move, you know, for a variety of, 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 of reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess I would say, um, and sometimes, you know, the, the phrase no borders bothers me because I, I think what it means is it means that we don't want to have state borders or nation state borders. Uh, of course, you know, our, our, our lives are, uh, you know, we navigate our social world through categories. And, you know, we have all kinds of borders in every aspect of our life. Often they're porous. You know, often, you know, they're open in different ways. But nonetheless, uh, you know, our, our social life is structured by borders that define our relationships and, you know, where, where we, uh, you know, participate. Um, and so I, I think part of the question is, you know, what kind of borders do we want to uh, do we want to promote and, you know, which ones do we want to reject? And, you know, Reese Jones is, uh, you know, has the wonderful phrase, you know, violent borders. And, you know, we want to re reject uh, vi violent borders, uh, borders imposed by, um, you know, armed guards and all, all of that. But I, I do think it's, it's a real kind of interesting question. If, if, we, if we move past that, well, what kind of communities do we want to construct? Because we do want to have communities and uh, that involve some form of closure closure is, isn't the same thing as saying we're not going to accept new members. Rather, it's, it's a way of navigating things. Let me just say one last thing about social categories. Um, you know, I think one thing we want to abolish, or I want to abolish, is the whole category of immigrant. The idea that the world can be divided into people who are, um, you know, belong to the soil or spring from the soil, to use, you know, Nandita's, uh, you know, term, and this idea of, you know, immigrants who are somehow apart. I think dividing the world up in that way, and thinking that's kind of the question uh, of, of borders, is it creates an enormous amount of harm and it's arbitrary and it doesn't represent people very well. So my thought for no, no borders uh, uh, philosophy, you know, we would get rid of that category of immigrant altogether, and we would use other social categories for thinking about how we relate to others in the world. Excellent. Well, thanks to both of you uh, for a great conversation, and thanks to those who asked questions in the Q and A. Uh, we're, 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 yeah, we're, we're wrapping up. We're out of time. Um, so anyway, thank you to everybody. Um, and, and thanks. Thank, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Anita. Bye, everyone.